Welcome everybody, uh, my name is Jen Torville and I'm going to kick us off here this morning. Um, we are going to start off with our agenda. So we're going to talk about a few things today as we understand our new workforce. So who are the generations in our workforce? I think we've got um, four, approaching five in our workforce right now. So where, where have we been and where are we going? What do we need to do right away? What are some tips and tricks and things that you can take away with you today? And also, we're gonna sprinkle in a few updates for 2017, because what kind of HR people would we be if we didn't give you some tips to go back to the office and do some more stuff, right? So we all know it's a tough market. Um, most employers are having trouble finding people and keeping people, right? Raise your hands, who's having trouble? <laughs> yep, it's a tough market. So we wanna attract and retain employees. We need to prepare for the future, so what are we gonna do to change and position ourselves? So I hope through today's seminar, you'll get some of that information to help you prepare. Um, let's go here. So new workplace norms. Here's some of the new normals that exist in our workplace. Who has employees that work remotely? Some of you. How about office hours, really strict office hours? I know in some of our industries it's hard to get away from, but really strict office hours. A couple of you. Technology. How's your technology efforts? Do employees get to pick what kind of devices they work on? Do you have great technology? Okay, crickets on that one. Okay. <laughs> Being nimble, so having the ability to make decisions quickly, move fast, kind of act like a millennial. Is anybody pretty nimble in their organizations? Okay, crickets again. And how about going green? We recycle. We do good things for our environment. A little bit, a little bit, okay. So these are some of our new workplace norms. These are kind of what our new workplace expects. Not just our millennials, all of our generations. <clears throat> and as we talk through this today, if you are a millennial in the room, I'm not trying to pick on you. So please don't, don't think that. And us in the older generations, we're not, I'm not trying to pick on you as well. So who is in our workforce? Every generation brings a unique set of needs to the workforce. It's not just our millennials. Workers of today want participation and be to be involved in making those workplace decisions. They want managers who are more sensitive and who are more responsive to them. They want managers who partner with them. In the past, we had basically two generations. We had our baby boomers, and baby boomers have kind of pushed off retirement for a variety of reasons and more millennials are entering the workforce. And then we've got the Gen Xers like me that are squeezed in the middle. Um, and having that multi-generational workforce does pose some challenges. So I want to, before we jump into walking through the generations, I want to just talk about what we can do to understand the massive generation of millennials that's coming into our workplace. So we'll start with traditionalists. So traditionalists are those people that are over the age of 70, less than four million of them are still working today. Some key defining things in their lives, so we, so we know kind of where they're coming from and what's shaped them as individuals, has been World War II, the Korean War, the Great Depression. They kind of have the mentality, we're gonna do what's right. We're gonna get the job done, follow orders. These are the people that have a job for life, right? These are like the people we know that have had one job. There's not a lot of them working anymore. The next is our baby boomers. Big population of baby boomers and a big population still working. They're in that 52 to 70 year old range. Some things that factored into shaping them into who they are, they saw assassinations of JFK, Martin Luther King Jr., the Vietnam War. They wanna make a difference. They wanna prove themselves to you. They appreciate processes. They made career changes, but only with the purpose. So as long as there was a purpose behind that career change, they would think about making one. And then our Gen Xers, the ones that we talk about, they get squeezed in the middle between the baby boomers and the millennials. These people entered the workforce or left college right as the technology boom was starting. 
saw the Challenger explode on TV, actually watched music videos on MTV. It, does anybody else remember that? Yeah, when MTV was music videos. The mentality is I have a separation between my job and my life. My job pays the bills, I protect my home life. This generation also saw some kind of unpleasant things in the 80s, parents lost jobs, they maybe don't feel as much loyalty to jobs as other generations might because of those influences growing up. Generation X also pushes back on the rules, maybe the rules don't always apply to me, they might question authority, but like our millennials, which we'll talk about next, Generation X is also very socially conscious. So here's our millennials, our pesky millennials, right? Our poor millennials that get picked on all the time. Um, they didn't know life without technology, really. They knew life with a cell phone. I remember my first cell phone came in a bag. I don't think millennials remember that. Uh, the Obama election was a big one that shaped who they are. They saw the 2008 economic downturn. And really kind of a good rule of thumb with millennials is if they didn't, um, if they don't remember 9-11, they probably can't be considered a millennial. But I'll tell you what they can be considered in just a moment. So they're multitaskers. If you have millennials on staff and you are maybe in a meeting with them and they're on their phone and you're talking, Chances are they're able to do two things at once effectively. I am not, because I'm a Gen Xer, but millennials can be on their phone and can multitask. They're connected and focused. They're dreamers. I think we've heard that a lot. They're, they're dreamers and optimistic. They're also very patriotic. And this generation does have some medical um, health concerns. They have a lot of stress in their lives, um, which can equal some some depression and some anxiety. So just know that about the millennials. They, are, they also like to have the freedom of choice. And because of the age we're in, obviously they're the most studied generation. So what's coming next? Well, they're calling them Gen Z right now. But millennials used to be called Gen Y as, as well, remember that? So <clears throat> this could change. So they have never known life without technology. They communicate in one word. They communicate, <clears throat> excuse me, in emojis. I get texts from my kids with like a K, like okay, but it's a K. And they also text me in emojis. Um, they won't share everything like millennials. Millennials are kind of that open book. And Gen Xers say, no, nah, I, I want a little bit of privacy here. Um, they are realistic about the workforce. So being that their age is 6 to 20, I don't know how we know all this already. But <laughs> it's interesting nonetheless. So it's something we're just going to have to keep our eyes on. And what's interesting about Gen Z is right now they make up about 25% of the population of the U.S. So there's a lot of them. And they're what's coming next. Okay. So we are going to watch a quick video. Welcome to the show. I am Ellen, and like many of you, I am a baby boomer. We are the generation that grew up drinking garden from garden hoses and drinking orange tang and drinking from our parents' liquor cabinet. <laughs> baby boomers were born between 1946 and 1964. They call us that because after the uh, World War II, there was a boom of babies being born. People were like, we lived through the war. Let's make whoopee. And <laughs> For you millennials, making whoopee is uh, like Netflix and chill. <laughs> but they were married. Millennials were born between 1982 and 2004. These are people who will never know the joy of using an end of a pencil to dial the phone. Do you remember that? You would actually... <laughs> I have some news for baby boomers. We are not the majority anymore. A new census says that millennials have overtaken us. And I know this because a 20-year-old staff member read it to me from the internet. <laughs> 
So I want to uh, play a little game. I am going to test the knowledge between uh, baby boomers and millennials and see how well they know each other. Tracy Woods and Chantel Miller, where are you two? All right, so I'm going to ask you questions about the other generation, and we'll see how well you all know each other, OK? okay. All right, we're going to start with uh, the baby boomer. What does, and don't help anybody, because we want to see how much she knows. What okay. does YOLO mean? YOLO. What do you think it means? It's an icon right. on the text messaging. N n no? Yeah. No? No? OK. No. All right. Um, hmm. You only live once. Oh, okay. YOLO. YOLO. Yeah. I knew that. Yeah, I know you knew yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> You're just getting started. That's right. Yeah. All right, what is your name? Chantal. And you are Tracy. Tracy. All right. So, uh, Chantal, uh, name all four Beatles. Ooh. Uh, actually, um, Paul McCartney. Yep, that's one. <laughs> John Lennon? Yes. Really? Yes. Oh! Yes. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, what, clearly I did. Yeah, you did. Um, Two others. Oh my gosh. Ooh. No clue. Oh my, no, no, Michael. No, not Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> but he did a song with Paul McCartney. He did Ebony and Ivory. Remember I, that? I do remember yeah. that. All right. Oh, okay. I don't think so. All right. So there was Ringo, oh. and then there was George Harrison. Okay. I'll have to go. Oh. I'll go right. Right. Yeah, okay. they were a really okay. good band. <laughs> they were. Yeah. They wrote a lot of songs. They were really, really. Yeah, good. they were great. All right, Tracy. On Tinder, what would you do if you really, 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 really like someone? Mm, I send them a great picture of my face. <laughs> Sign it. Um, Tinder. Let me see. Do you know what Tinder um, is? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dating app. Okay. Oh, okay. What would she do if she really, really, really? Super like, swipe yeah, up. Yeah, you can oh, only okay. super like, but you can only do it once every 24 hours or something. You That's have it? to. Okay. You can't like too many people. Oh, not too yeah. Many. All right. <laughs> All right. Who can turn the world on with a smile? You can. Yes, I can. <laughs> OK, you're not going to win anything here today if you knew all of those answers. Sorry. Sorry about that. But we are going to play our own version of Ellen here. So uh, millennials, raise your hands. Who are my millennials in the room? OK, so millennials and everybody else. It's millennials versus everybody else, OK? <laughs> millennials, you cannot answer this first question. We're going to go every other, every other, OK? So millennials, zip it. OK, every other generation, who's that? Right away, OK. Everybody else, we don't get to answer this one. This is just for our millennials. What does that mean? Oh, when you call the, um, you used to call 411 when you needed to get someone. Yep, or... information. Yep. Yep, you could actually call 411 and then we would use it as a saying too, like, what's a 411? <laughs> okay, everybody else in the room, what does that mean? I don't know. I don't know. I know you know. Okay, millennials, who is that? Captain Tennille? <laughs> he is the captain of the love boat. Captain, older generation, say it with me. Stubing. I worked with a guy. We were um, talking about the love boat one day, and he was a millennial and trying to like get in the conversation. And he was like, yeah, Captain Stubbing. And we were like, oh, no. <laughs> nope. Captain Stubing, you're wrong. You're wrong. All right, millennials, you're not allowed to answer this one. Every other generation. What does that mean? Talk to you later. OK, millennials, who are these guys? 90210. All right. All right, kind of fun, huh? You're, you're cuspers. We're going to talk about you a little later, too. So the generations in our workforce, really, we span four generations, almost five, depending on your industry, because we've got Gen Z as well. Starting in 2011 until 2029, 65, uh, boomers are turning a rate of 65 at 8,000 a day. So 8,000 
people every day are turning 65 that could leave your workforce. Think about the gap that might create. While those boomers are retiring, and a lot of them are retiring, only 76 million millennials are entering the workforce. And we're going to have some gaps. Millennials are our largest generation in the workplace. They make up about 75%, or will make up about 75% by 2025, and they are our largest generation in the workforce right now. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Steph. Thank you. All right, so we're going to talk about then and now a little bit. Um, so, and this, this is something I've been hearing for probably about 10 years. I don't know if it's a generational thing or if it's just some of us get older, we start to say more of these things. Um, but HR professionals said that young employees expect to move up the ladder quickly. Okay, all right, thanks Connie. Um, they expect to move up the ladder quickly, which causes some friction. Um, they're not shy to tell their boss that they want their job. Um, I've actually had many people who weren't afraid to do this, but they were definitely on the younger side while they were at their job where they felt compelled to do so. Um, it's a difficult attitude to accept for some older employees, especially those that value seniority. So if, if we have workplaces where, you know, you, even if it's non-union, you look at people who have been there 20 years and they make the decisions even if they're not in a leadership position. They're the go-to people. Some of our, our, our younger people don't like that. They don't work like that. It doesn't, it doesn't work for them. So we're seeing some differences there. Um, so now looking forward to the future. 2017 is pretty much now. We have a month to go. Recruiting is still expected to be a challenge. Um, the unemployment rate is low. Uh, right now, I think it's in Minnesota, it's been the lowest we've seen since 2010, which is fantastic. Um, millions of boomers are leaving the workplace, as Jen said, which is important to remember. There's fewer young people to replace them. So we have to really think about where we're gonna get these people. Um, you're gonna have to be more innovative and more strategic in your recruiting efforts. Uh, and hiring has increased almost 70% this past year for employers. That's a huge uptick. I mean, we all remember around 2010, 2011, the unemployment rate started to get a bit high. People were a little nervous, but we had a ton of applicants for every position. I mean, there was, there was no shortage. It was, it was kind of a, a, really, a really good time for recruiters because they could find great people, their metrics were good. But at the same time, we're slowly inching the other way where work is about to get a little bit more difficult. If you look at um, the trucking industry, for instance, if any of you have, have some of those, um, we're going to see a shortage of over 100,000 drivers in the near future. That's a <coughs> lot of people. I mean, that's a, the replacements are going to have less experience. They're going to need more training. There's more rules. There's more regulations. Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of a cycle we're seeing coming to a head at this point. Um, there'll be significant gaps in other areas as well, uh, specifically engineering, utilities, education. Those are some big ones. So which I guess I'm going to, we can take a look at this. This is kind of our, our generations to get a better view of it. But if anyone's willing to share some of the positions they're having trouble recruiting for right now, does anyone have anything specifically? Yeah. Yep. yep. So you, you have a harder job of selling what you do to get those people rather than the money, the benefits. It's, it's caring. Anybody else? Yeah. Nurses and IT. Nurses and IT. Well, if any of you have, you have kids going to college soon, <laughs> good reminder. Yeah. We're struggling to find uh, construction workers who will travel. Oh, For the yes. Most part, we're, we're a Minnesota company, but Yep. Most of our projects, we do large industrial complexes and we're okay. all over the nation. 
<laughs> and to find people who are willing to be gone on the road for weeks and sometimes even months. Yeah. Can't find them. Yeah, and in the previous generation, that would have been completely normal. Like, mom will stay home and take care of the kids. Dad can travel for work. It's not like that anymore. We, <laughs> we're different. Our society is different. Our generations know it. All right. So our perception of our millennials in the workplace, and I think millennials really get a raw deal. Because, I mean, when I'm a Gen X, and when I first started out 20 years ago, <laughs> People said this about us. We were slackers. We were, we were wearing our grunge, listening to Nirvana. I mean, we, we didn't wash our hair for a while. I mean, it was, it was different. So people said these same items about us. Um, this is interesting, though, how millennials describe themselves versus how HR people are seeing them. So, <laughs> yeah. 65% of them think they're people savvy. HR says, nope, 14%. Sorry. Um, they only think 35% tech savvy. HR people think they really know their technology. So that's an assumption that maybe we shouldn't make all the time. 82% um, of them think they're loyal to their employers. Look at that. 1%. We think they are ready to go. Like they're leaving. 14% of them think they're fun loving. HR thinks they're much more fun than they do. And finally, 86% of them think they're hardworking. HR, 11%. So we're seeing those differences really come out, especially when we're, we're polling both, both sets of people. Um, it's important to remember, too, that I think millennials are a little bit more old-fashioned than we think. Um, they tend to view their organizational <coughs> leaders with a little bit more respect than maybe like a Gen X does. Um, they're, they're a little bit more like baby boomers or traditionalists in that way. All right. And no one has better values. They just have different values. They have a different way of doing things. Um, they've been raised differently. Again, going back to what Jen said, they have different things going on in their lives. They've grown up differently than some, some of us um, older generation people. Okay, so nobody has better values, we just have different values, and we had the piece of the puzzle of the two people coming together. So let's think about that when we think about your team. So thinking about your employees at work, you might know who they are, but you have no idea really who they are or what they're about. They're like an iceberg. So we only see what's on the surface, right? Think about all those things, even about yourselves that are under the surface that you don't talk about at work. There's a ton of stuff that makes up who somebody is. And if you think about employees like a puzzle, <clears throat> every team and every employee is diverse. Some things that come into play here that I'll just point out, age and birth year. These dates aren't set in stone for our generations. Um, I think it was you, right, the cusper. And I identify, even though I'm Gen X, there's a lot of things from a millennial standpoint that I can identify with as well kind of being on, on that cusp within a few years. Um, birth, birthplace and nationality, that's an interesting one. If you have staff members that are first generation Americans, they're gonna act more like traditionalists than the generation they fall within. So keep that in mind. And then birth, I'm sorry, and then culture. So different cultures, if they weren't raised here in the US, culture is different as well. Other things could be their sphere of influence when they were growing up, so what their home life was like, and all of those other factors that happened in the world. Baggage. We don't want employees bringing baggage to work, right? Sounds like a lot of drama, but everybody has some baggage. They all have those unique experiences that make them who they are. And then communicating with our four generations in the workplace, maybe five for some of you. Our traditionalists want you to write them a letter and they're gonna carry a briefcase to work. Our baby boomer says, call me. The Gen X, me, I say, text me, or, or I'm, say, I'm sorry, I say, email me. And the millennial says, text me. So my mom and I have this deal. She's a baby boomer, I'm a Gen Xer. She wants to talk to me probably every day. And I love to talk to my mom, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not a bad daughter. But I don't wanna talk every day. So we have a deal where we will talk at least once a week on the phone and we will either email, text, or Facebook messenger each other almost every day. So we've compromised. 
So I encourage you to find some of those areas of uh, compromise within your organizations as well and with, on your teams. So the future is here. These are the things that employees expect now. This is, this is our current state. And I know this slide is a little hard to read and probably very tiny on your piece of paper. But the oldest millennial is about 35. So this isn't really all that new. So millennials and our generations in the workplace right now, we're evolving to not working that straight nine to five. You can work anywhere. We have the, the capabilities and technology to work anywhere on any device. Our millennials want a career path. They want that ladder. They want to know what it takes to become a leader within your organization. So the future is here. All of these past practices, they're not going to work so much anymore. So where do we start with all of this? Well, we're going to start at the beginning. Uh, so as we said before, 2017 is definitely a job seekers year. Um, again, for all the recruiters in the room, this is extremely important. Your job is going to get much more difficult. I think even in the next few years, you're going to see that trend continue. Um, and to keep up with demand, you know, we have to offer traditional and non-traditional benefits and incentives to lure candidates. Um, of course, we always have the medical coverage, 401k, uh, raising salary offers. How many of you have had to do that? Significantly raise salary in order to get good people? A few, a few. That's probably going to continue. Um, we'll see our comp studies start to go up as well due to that. Um, and then your, your current employees will start to become an issue, but we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, <laughs> awarding monetary bonus, um, bonuses, um, talking about referrals. So if you refer a great employee, if they're there for a while, really kind of upping the amount of that monetary bonus you're willing to give. Um, flexible work hours. Who, who is deluged with requests for flexible work hours right now? It's, it's so common now. Everyone in interviews, that's one of the questions that every single person asks. Do you have a flexible work schedule? Other, other than working from home, that's what they ask. <laughs> and then finally, a casual dress code. Um, we see it even in our office uh, that things are getting much more casual. And of course, it depends on where you work. Um, it depends on who's coming into your office, who sees you, that sort of thing. Okay. We've got our hipsters up here for recruitment. Um, there is no such thing as the perfect hire. What we're going to be looking for is the right fit. And this is kind of the beginning of that. We want to make sure we're getting that right fit in the door the first time. Um, so how do, you, how do you find that? We start with the job posting. You want to make sure your job postings are short and to the point. Um, one of the things I've noticed recently is many companies are just putting up their job descriptions as postings. It's, it's the easy way, right? You have 10 positions you need to post, and boy, that goes up there super quick. Um, but one of the problems with that is, especially millennials, but even some Gen Xers, they're not reading your whole posting. They're glancing at it. It's too long. They're like, oof, I'm over this. They just, it's not that they don't have the patience, but they want that information quickly. They want something to stand out to really grab them as to why your position is the one they should apply for. Um, so some things that you can do uh, accurately to define success for that position, maybe even in the first line. Like if you're, if you're really great at um, giving presentations, I don't know. If you're really great at employee benefits, this is the place for you. If you if you strive to, I don't know, sell a lot of benefits or HR systems, this is the place for you. I mean, really grab them right away. And be authentic in the recruiting process. Um, be truthful about your mission, vision, and values. Um, you don't have to always put that in the posting, because that would obviously make for quite a long posting at certain organizations. Um, but make sure you're truthful about that, and make sure you're always thinking of that during the process. If you don't have a good, solid mission, vision, values, I would recommend going to your leadership team, or if you are the leadership team, and really take a look, because people are looking at that more now than ever, and it's very important. Um, don't pretend the job is something it isn't. Um, if this is, 
say, just for sake of, of the audience, if this is a generalist position, don't advertise it like it's a management position. Because as people, when, once they get around to reading that whole posting, they're not going to apply if it seems too difficult or if it seems over their head. But then you're going to get the, the managers who might apply because, oh, that actually looks like what I do now. That might be a great fit. They're going to get in the position and realize it's not really what you said it was. So be, be careful that uh, it's accurate. And then finally, explain where the company is and where you want to go. So what are your goals? Kind of what, what's the future of the organization? Be able to explain that to your candidates. Um, and also be open and honest during the process and keep it moving. So I don't, I don't know, I mean, recruiting is really hard sometimes. I mean, you could have 40 positions open and you've got 300 applicants out there. It, it gets very time consuming. So it's important to follow up quickly. So if you bring in five or six people to interview, um, make sure you're getting back to them within a couple of weeks. Um, I, usually a good rule of thumb is a week. Um, if people are going to be traveling out of town or something, try to delay that if you can. Um, delay even the interview process. Not too long because you don't want to miss the good people. Um, you got to move fast. They're not waiting around. The companies that are agile and recruiting quickly are going to grab them. So keep that in mind as well. And engagement starts before your new hire starts. So say you go into um, an office for an interview. They're recruiting you. You feel good about it. You had a great interview. Um, you feel good about this new person who might join the team. You're ready to make an offer. Before that, you want to make sure that you've done everything you can to represent the company the way it is and let them know that communication is key. So you've called them to update them on the status. Um, you've, you've told them what the next steps will be. Uh, make sure you, that you make those, those contacts with them. Make them feel like they're already part of the team. And I would do that for the top three or four. I mean, I don't want to um, make them all feel like they're getting the job, but I want them to feel good about the organization. Once you've given that offer, make sure you continue to communicate with them. Send them an email about their first day. Give them a call. Send them a small gift. I know before I came here, Jen sent me this really cute notebook. Um, I think the front said, you got this? Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I do. Like, Let's go. I'm super pumped. Um, but it just, it just made me feel really good about my choice to want to work for this organization because she added a personal touch that was important. Um, yeah, so people are searching around to understand what your culture is online too. So keep an eye out on Glassdoor and Yelp. I, really, if you haven't gone out and searched your own organization, definitely do that. You might be surprised what you find. Um, most are fairly positive. Um, job seekers are very positive. They're, they're excited about kind of their next step. But you might have some negative things. And it's important to look at those and talk those over with leadership. Don't just ignore them. Because it's out there and, and everybody's looking, especially millennials and Gen Z coming up. Um, that's all they've known. Word of mouth is not as important to them as it was to us. All right. And managers, um, obviously a lot of this room is HR. So you guys know some of this, but managers should be prepared to discuss the opportunity in terms of benefits to the candidate. How is this going to benefit you and your career in the long run? Um, and then make sure the, the new employee has enthusiasm because of what the company stands for, what they have to offer, and not just because they're new. Um, so while it's, it's difficult to keep singing the praises, you kind of need to, to add that in a little bit here and there. All right. Stay competitive. Be proactive, not reactive. Easier said than done. Um, it's hard waiting for a rec to get approved to recruit a new employee. You have a team that has two out of their five people and they're scrambling. Um, once you get that approval though, really be proactive and, and, and kind of go after it. Part of doing that um, is when you interview people, leave them with a story to tell. Uh, make sure that you've given them information about the organization and that you've helped them to stay excited about the position. Uh, part of that is going to be employment branding, too. If you don't have an employment brand, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but that's really important. Even if it's not a huge marketing initiative, it's something you yourself need to think about when you're talking to um, internal and external people. 
Um, you could even, during the interview process, give a goodie bag. If your organization makes something uh, that's unique or interesting, you could always you know, share that with, with candidates. Um, a folder, a notebook, <laughs> always give your business cards, that sort of thing. Um, if you do electronic business cards, make sure you send them. Um, that's kind of the newest thing I've seen. Uh, so when I personally, when I know a recruiting process has gone well, um, the way I know that is when I call one of the candidates who didn't get the position and thank them for their time, but let them know that they did not get selected, they say thank you. Because nobody calls. Once you go for that second or third interview, you get a form email. And it's just, it's sort of a sinking feeling because candidates start to think, was, was I that terrible during the interview process that no one even called me to, to tell me? Uh, and many people will be shocked when you call because it's not common, but it's all about goodwill. It leaves them feeling good about your organization. And when they go on Glassdoor, they'll talk about the interview process, they'll rate your interview process, and hopefully they'll say, you know, I didn't get the position, but they were really gracious to me. And that's important. It's not just the company's reputation, but I think anyone who does recruiting, they want their reputation to be good and they want to feel good about that too. You never know when that person could help you find your next opportunity. All right. So again, it's a candidate-driven market. Um, it, it creates a situation for your employees who may not be looking to be wooed by your competition. So there, there are many organizations that are actively reaching out to people on LinkedIn right now and reaching out to their friends and their friends and their friends and their friends and they're trying to steal your employees. So be good to your employees as well. <laughs> and when you're recruiting, if you can do that internally, try to. Try to develop those employees and give them more opportunity. Um, three in 10 employees say they're likely to look for a new job within the next two years, which is nothing new. The last decade has really looked like that. We don't have people staying 10, 20 years. It's two to three and they're on to the next opportunity. They don't want to lag behind on the technology and they don't want to lag behind on development. You know, oftentimes we're so excited about new employees that we send them to trainings, we send them to seminars. We're, we're so excited to get them up to speed and going that we forget about the people that have maybe been there three to five years. They want those same opportunities and they need those same things. So talking about employer brand, now, I'm sure everyone's got a marketing department who sells your products, your services, um, and you, if, if they'll help you, that's fantastic. But if you don't already have an employee, employer brand for your recruiting purposes, really think about that. Um, I think if, if you want to be an employer of choice, you really have to think how you're going to stand apart from the crowd. Um, so if it's that you have a great culture, just a great atmosphere, um, you have team breakfasts, you have charitable opportunities to work together as a team um, at some sort of charity organization. Um, those kinds of benefits create kind of who you are and you need to talk about them a lot. And think outside the box. These are just some of the things you could talk about that you could do um, and that you could stay competitive throughout that process. Some are free, some are not. Um, these are kind of some of the benefits that attract and retain people. It's not always the money, it's not always the health care. Health care is looking very similar no matter where you go now. Um, ECA changed a lot of that, we'll see how it goes. Um, but well-being room, just a room where if someone needs to just take a break, they can go be by themselves. I don't know, how many people in here are introverts? Nobody, just me? Yeah, they're not willing to admit it because they don't want to. Um, Well-being rooms are good for, for people like us. We need a little time away to not talk and to maybe rejuvenate ourselves. Um, health fairs, shift differential, on-site gardens. If you have room for that, that would be really cool. Um, dry cleaning, blood mobile, I don't know. Um, recognition programs, flexible schedules, paid time off to volunteer. Those are some of the big ones. Does anybody here have something original or unique that they've done? Nothing? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, it might be up there. It's a lot to read through. But yeah. We do an annual community service day where we actually, I work at a college, and we close all of our campus locations. Oh. And actually go out all in one day across the U.S. and volunteer. 
Yeah. It's a huge loan receipt benefit for employees in the forced charity. That's awesome. I mean, forced charity isn't a bad thing because it makes everybody get out of the office and it makes everybody take that time. Um, I've heard a lot of companies using forced vacation where, yeah, we're going to give you this amount of PTO, um, but you have to take it quarterly. Um, that's been <laughs> a big change as well. All right. I think Jen's going to share some onboarding wisdom with us. So the introverts in the room want the wellness room to decompress. And me, the extrovert, I want work spirit week, like homecoming week at work. I want that really bad. So onboarding. So you've done the right things through the recruitment process. <clears throat> you've attracted that great candidate. And now you've hired them. So what are we going to do to keep that enthusiasm of that new hire real? not just based on the newness of the job, because a newness job feeling, that change, that is kind of exciting and exhilarating, maybe not for the three introverts in the room. <laughs> but we want the new hire to keep thinking, this company is a great fit for me because of everything I've seen thus far. They're excited about the work that you do because, again, they had that great understanding during the rec recruitment process. And you're going to continue co to connect those dots through the onboarding process. So what do you guys think of the idea of just get them in, get a butt in a chair, and get them working? Think that's a good idea? No? What about throw them to the wolves? Sink or swim? Do you ever hear those terms in your organizations, or have you ever heard those terms in life? Yes. Well, if we do that, if we have this sink or swim mentality, we're going to lose about 22% of new hires within the first 45 days. So we can't throw them to the wolves. We can't sink or swim. We can't just throw them in a chair because we need a butt in a chair. Gone are the days of that quick get in, get, get working on the job training. Everyone wants to feel welcome. Maybe that feels a little fluffy to you. Maybe you're rolling your eyes a little bit. It's OK. But everybody wants to feel welcome. Onboarding is about welcoming that new hire. It's about nurturing them. It's about the personal approach. Most companies drop the ball right here. This is where we drop the ball a lot because it's hard work. It's hard work to keep doing that. Onboarding really introduces people to your values, your um, culture, and the people that work for you. Onboarding is a great time for them to understand how am I going to impact the business? How am I going to make a difference here? And the millennial generation really wants to make a difference. So and if they're going to make up 75% of your workforce by 2025, we need to start doing these things now. So how can a structured onboarding program really help you retain people? Well, it really can because you're showing your people that you're, you're happy that they're there. You just didn't hire them and throw them in a cube. We want to make sure we do all the right things again. Gratitude, check-ins, scheduling time on your calendar now because we're all human beings and things get away from us and we forget. So make sure that you're checking in with that new hire so they feel seen and heard and even accountable. They want that. And the great thing with gratitude and check-ins, those things are free. You don't have to spend any money on that. Companies with engaging onboarding programs retained 91% of those new hires that went through that engaging onboarding program after the first year. So by <clears throat> having those check-ins, gratitude, holding them accountable, they know what success looks like, they know how they're measured, 91% of them hung out because they had that engaging onboarding program. By creating that standardized onboarding process, after about three years, 58% were still there. Those are big numbers. Learning takes time. Recruiting takes time. All of these things take time, and time can be, time can cost you money. So let's, let's really set these new hires up for success through some of the free, the free things that we can do. Having that 30, 60, 90 day plan, that's great. But go above that even. What does six months look like? What does that year look like? Really focus your time and your attention on them so they can be successful. 
And here's another millennial statistic. 49% of millennials said, I want to be, um, I want to have a good onboarding experience at work. Almost half of millennials want to have a good onboarding experience. So by approaching our onboarding with care and doing the right things, just like we did in the recruitment process, we're going to really set up our new hire for success. OK, so some success stories. We're going to use Google as our baseline, which I, seems crazy, right, that Google's the baseline of what we're going to talk about here. But Google, when they hire people, they have five things they ask managers to do. And managers don't have to do any of them. But on Sunday night, because Google starts people on Monday, on Sunday night, HR sends an email to the manager and says, here's the five things you can do. Remember to tell your person what their role and what their responsibilities are here. Get them a peer, get them a buddy, get them somebody hooked up with so they have somebody, that first friend at work. Make introductions. Take the new hire around the office, introduce them to people. Check in once a month through six months and encourage open dialogue. So again, Google says you don't have to do these things, but these are the things that we've seen equal success. So we're going we're gonna to remind you that if you want to do them, you can. So then Netflix says, OK, Google, I see what you're doing. We're going to do that. Plus, we're going to have our CEO meet with all of the new hires. That's very impactful. Netflix is also in a very unique business in technology, so they let new hires choose what kind of technology they want to work on. Not all of us have that luxury, but if you work at Netflix, you probably would. So then, then Zappos says, OK, Google and Netflix, you're doing good stuff. We're going to raise the bar even more. We're going to put new hires through a five-week onboarding training program. So I don't know what that onboarding program looks like, if it's every day for five weeks, if it's once a week, one, one hour a day, I don't know. But basically they're saying, after you finish this five weeks, if you don't like it here, we're going to pay you $2,000 to leave. And only about 1% of employees take the money and run. Because they've been so diligent in that structured process to make sure they're hiring the right people. They're very committed to hiring the right people because if you hire a toxic person or somebody who just doesn't fit in, that's going to destroy your culture. And culture is very important to all three of these companies. OK, I know it's an annoying business phrase, but we do want them to drink the Kool-Aid, right? Has everybody heard that phrase? Yeah, OK. People go home every night, and they talk about you and they talk about the company to your to their friends their families partners spouses if they're not happy the word is going to get around so we have a, our resident millennial <laughs> molly is going to come up and share her <laughs> onboarding story i feel like i'm at a meeting hi i'm molly i'm a millennial <laughs> <laughs> um so i asked jen if i could tell the story because i think it's pretty Telling. I have about five years of experience, and this is my third company. I'm also an optimist, so if you look at my LinkedIn, I love my other companies too. I don't <laughs> want to talk poorly about them, but to put in perspective, my onboarding here has been really refreshing to think about, and the reason I left my other companies are pretty parallel to my onboarding. So my first company was huge, and they hired me in a month that was super busy for them. So no one was in the office except for the person training me, um, I didn't have a lunch, no one really talked to me, and I'm an extroverted person, so I found my own friends, but for the most part, I felt pretty small and invisible, and I don't know, I just didn't really feel welcome there. And my boss, if she was in the room, she interviewed me once for a promotion, she's like, so why should I promote you? I'm like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know why I'm here. I, it was never explained to me why I was hired, so I ended up going to a smaller company thinking that would be a better fit for me. Um, and at the smaller company, uh, they did a great onboarding, but they didn't have anything for me to do. So my first week, I spent a ton of time being like, I wonder what this company's about. Pretending to be busy, but really I was like reading the news because I didn't have a lot of things to work on. And then I ended up leaving that company because I didn't really ever find a purpose. I didn't really feel like that was a good fit for me. Um, and then I interviewed here, and 
my interviewing experience was great, um, but what sticks out is I sent an email accepting my offer and my boss, Alan, who was in the back, was like, you just made my week that you're coming on board. This is so exciting. And then I got a call from Jen and she was so genuinely excited that I was joining the team. She's like, give me a call back. I want to tell you all the nuts and bolts and how to be a consultant. And I was like, wow, they're really excited for me to start working here. And then my first week, I really cannot speak more highly of it. I met clients my first week. It was super busy and then I left at three every day. They're like, we don't have anything else for you to do today. So why don't you go home? I was like, wow, you're so respectful of my time. So looking back on it, this is what I've learned is like, whatever emotion your employee feels the first week, it stays with them because you have to undo it. So if I felt like a burden or I felt like I didn't have a purpose, they had to undo that for me in my first two companies and MMA does not have to undo that right now. So I joke that I'm for sure not gonna be the 22% that's gonna leave after 45 days because my 45 days is next week. Um, <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I'm still down and find yes. But I do think if I've learned anything, it's that onboarding is so important and I don't think enough companies invest in it. So from a millennial perspective, if you're hiring millennials, I would spend more time on onboarding than you think you should because it does, it sticks with them and it sets them up for their career at your company. So that's my story, thank you. Thanks, Molly. So again, onboarding programs are the first touch your organization makes with that new hire. And we have like a real life example and a story for you to take back and, and to be able to tell. Again, people like to tell stories. In order to make a great impression, you have to make sure they're set up for success. We want all new hires to drink the Kool-Aid. We don't want to be in that 45 day mark where 22% of our new hires leave. So some tips we can take away right, right away today. Four ways to get an employee off to a perfect start. This is from Inc. Magazine. So explain how your business creates value. What is your competitive edge? What do you do? Employees also need to know how to work with their internal and external customers, how they create value. This is a really tricky spot, but this is really important because all of us in every role, we have internal and external customers for the most part. Get some wins right away. Set those immediate goals and start giving feedback, obviously. But what are some wins that a new, a new hire can have right away? Day one is probably orientation where you're filling out forms. That doesn't feel very meaningful, right? So what is something you can do within that first week? Can you get them out to a client site? Can there be some sort of really meaningful work that has a win or an accomplishment? And then explain exactly why you hired them. This is a great opportunity to praise your new hire and you're really tying in why you hired them and how they match up with the job. You're reinforcing that, what you said during the recruitment process. And I think few statements are really, I, I don't think there's anything more motivating really than to hear why your boss hired you. And Alan, we won't put you on the spot right now. <laughs> okay, so now we hired them we, and we've, Got them on board, how are we gonna retain them? Yes. So if recruiting was important, onboarding is important, employee retention might be even more important. Um, few reasons to this. We have to give them meaningful work, otherwise they're going to leave us for someone who will give them meaningful work. Um, you know, like crisis nursery, having trouble finding people, um, but if you get those people who are really looking for meaningful work in their lives, making a difference, that might be right up, right up their alley. Um, there are parts of the job that, of course, nobody wants to do. There's a lot of administrative tasks that slow us down during the day. Um, but, you know, make, make sure there's other things to kind of balance that out. Um, and that's a given, of course. Um, ensure the employees have a purpose. Um, Molly talked about that. Uh, provide del development growth, room to grow, um, do you have succession planning? Um, have you given people a path, a career path, and, and, and something they can strive towards? Um, obviously every year we have our performance management usually. Um, I've seen a lot of companies moving that down to every six months. I've seen companies moving that to quarterly narratives, um, that sort of thing. But make sure you're, you're always talking about that development and make sure that um, you're focusing on that. Uh, give people training, on-the-job training, off-site seminars. 
Again, don't forget about them after they've got their first couple of years in and they're not new anymore. Now they're, oh, they've been here forever, people. Make sure you're continuing to give them those opportunities. Uh, millennials say their leadership skills are not fully developed. That's one thing they want to focus on um, that just isn't being taken care of. So keep that in mind. Recognize your employees, but ask them how they want to be recognized. Um, ask them in private maybe, you know, do you prefer you know, me announcing whatever win you've, you've received in a team meeting? Would you rather I sent you an email? Would you rather I literally gave you a pat on the back? What works for you? Um, usually cash is not an option, but just try, try to get them open and talking so you get to know them as people and how they prefer things to go. Um, and leaders, you need to be invested in your people. You need to show them that you're invested. Um, if you don't think people first and act that way, you're going to have an engagement problem and you're going to have people leave. Uh, hopefully it's not a lot, but some will. And some may never be engaged and there's nothing we can do about that. But we wanna do everything in our power to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay. All right. That was. The, the final element of retention is mentoring. Um, and again, mentoring is not, um, it's not training, it's not onboarding, it's not orientation, it's none of those things. It's literally your first friend at work, the person who is encouraging you to get out and see people and meet people. It encourages those office relationships. Um, they show you the organizational norms. They'll, they'll show you where the pot machine is um, the bathrooms. If you ever worked downtown, the first time you worked downtown, wouldn't you have loved someone to give you a tour of the Skyway? It's, it's a lot. I still have trouble and I worked down there a good 10 years. And I'm, once you get into Macy's, all bets are off. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's awful. Anyways, new hires need a specific go-to person for questions that they may not, might not want to ask their coworkers or their boss. Maybe someone in another department who just likes the organization and can talk about it. Remember, it doesn't have to be a formal process. You can formalize it a bit, but it doesn't have to be. Just make sure you pick people who will be good mentors. If you know there's someone in your office who, who sort of um, maybe speaks a little negatively about people from time to time, and maybe they're, they're not the most fun person to be around, maybe don't make them a mentor. Really pick people who want to be involved in kind of that relationship. Mentoring is also succession planning. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who cross departments based on meeting their mentor and meeting people they work with and realize, gosh, you know, that might be a really great place to work. Most HR people, you didn't start off going, I want to be in HR. Some of us did, but others did not. And you ended up here. And it's probably because you met someone, you saw the HR people at work, somehow they, they, they got you in. Um, but it's important because now you have a career you love probably, right? Yep, yep. All right. Bottom line, mentoring is a retention tool. All right. I'm going to talk specifically about retaining millennials. Um, and again, I want to say we have absolutely nothing against millennials. We heart them. Right, Molly? Um, I'm going to make fun of her a little bit soon, but... It's, it's all in good fun. Um, retaining millennials, there are certain things they want. We've talked a lot about how to recruit them, onboard them, you know, kind of engage them. But we have to make sure that we collaborate and give them a diverse social environment. Um, again, this is going to be different for everybody, though. Um, so that's one thing to remember. We categorize everybody into these generations and tell you how to treat them. But they're all individuals as well. So again, if they're on that cusp, they may be a little different. Um, you know, I used to, back probably about 15 years ago, I would have said, yes, I'm a Gen Xer. I don't know what these baby boomers are doing. I don't understand it. Uh, and then they started talking about Gen Y, and I was only a few years away, and I'm thinking, oh, this doesn't sound right either. But as I'm getting older, I feel like I'm going in the opposite direction. I'm, the ideals of millennials are more and more appealing. And I think it's just that freedom to kind of be yourself and it doesn't, it doesn't squash your personality and your drive quite as much as, as maybe generations past may have. Um, 
Millennials want to receive advice from their peers, not just an annual performance review. They want to hear consistent feedback, um, especially right after they've done something good or maybe not so good. They want to know about it. They don't want to wait. Um, they prefer a casual attire so they can be themselves, their true selves, and feel comfortable in their environment. Um, they want personal development. Um, they value the nature and the importance of the work they're doing over pay and benefits, which, it de depending, I should say, <laughs> right? If, if we said you're getting paid nothing, the importance would, would kind of... Alan's here, I'll do my job for free. Oh, <laughs> yes, of course. 65% uh, of millennials agree that the opportunity for personal development was the most influential influential factor in taking their position. 73% uh, of them uh, are aspiring to be workplace leaders within five years. That's amazing. I mean, 10, 15 years ago, the leaders had all been at the company for 20 years. That's how you became a leader. You stayed, you paid your dues. Millennials don't feel that way. They're, they're gonna work hard and they're going to put in a lot of effort and use their skills and they feel within five years they should be able to uh, take on a leadership role. Let's see, millennials also want more formal leadership training. So while mentoring, we want to have mentors, we want to have them be part of um, meetings and leadership committees and all those things, but they want that formal training as well. Um, and they want things clearly explained to them. Again, what is my career path? Um, these are the people who want to see it on a spreadsheet or an org chart. They want to see exactly where they can go and what steps they need to take to get there. And uh, finally, their, their desires permeate their personal and professional lives when it comes to development and who they are. Um, much like the baby boomers, it's looking like millennials feel like th the impact they're making in the workplace is similar to that outside of the workplace and they want to celebrate both. They don't want them to be separate. Um, millennials also want to be heard. Uh, the biggest lesson we learned about millennials is that it's critical to listen to them. Um, all of our employees really, obviously we should be listening to, but for millennials that's very important and they take it very seriously. Um, if you ask questions of them or any of your employees, you ask them to share answers, say a survey, focus group, something like that, make sure you do something with those responses. Uh, make sure that you're, you're dealing with them as they come through and make sure you're, you're dealing with them individually. <laughs> this is just fun. They can listen to me, listen to me. Like, like I do this all the time, and if I go out at the, at the house with the little girl, Matthew has his toys, and then Matthew has all his toys. Okay. But I have to yell at you guys. Okay, Linda, Linda, listen, Be listen, 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 you listen, listen, Linda, listen. Okay, what? Like everything they do at this house, they can't trust everything at Grandma's house. <laughs> listen, Linda, seriously, right? All right. All right. That's just a, a quick, fun video about listening. Um, I think I have a four-year-old, and most of the time, I do not listen. Um, I, it's sort of in one ear, out the other. I just, I, it gets to be a bit much. Um, but one thing to consider is, you know, as every generation comes up, we all feel like we're listening, we're hearing, but we're, we're not. We're not actively hearing what people are saying. So make sure that, that you're doing that. And focus on your people. Um, listen, uh, be present, be considerate of their needs, um, get to know what those needs are because again everyone's different. We can categorize them by generations and have an idea but people are different. Um, provide the training tools and resources, um, keep employees in the loop, apply policies consistently, um, help them find their balance between home and work. Um, I think it used to be work life versus home life and now we're seeing work and personal life integration, 
where you're sort of <laughs> kind of combining them all into one big life, which kind of sounds like what we maybe should have been doing all along. Uh, it doesn't have to be quite so separate. Uh, demonstrate respect for their time and create an environment that makes people feel good about participating. If they feel good about your organization and they feel good about coming to work every day, they're going to stay. Because being valued cannot easily be replaced. So, um, as we come back from break, we're going to talk about understanding the workforce. And I have a video to show you. Now, keep in mind, uh, this is just for fun. This is a, a little spin on millennials. So, we're not picking on anybody. Please don't be mad. This is just all in fun. So, Marathon Industries, give me a breakdown. It's a B2B company that provides uh, cloud storage for Fortune 500 companies. Chet, what did the market research turn up? What? Oh, I Googled them, but the results were weird. You didn't use the market research database that we spent thousands of dollars a month on and that you were specifically trained to use. I quit. This job is different than I thought it would be. Stop. Does this situation look familiar? A new type of worker has entered the workforce. They're called millennials. And they're terrible. Today, I'm going to teach you all about this new breed of worker so you can avoid misunderstandings in which you feel the need to fire them immediately. In the first reimagination we just saw, Mary makes the classic mistake of not reassuring Chet while offering overflowing amounts of praise. Chet. You were so smart to use Google. That's the perfect way to start the research. You're so smart. Great job. So the uh, conference call is scheduled for 10.30. So that we're on the same page, let's do a pre-call about 9.30 a.m. I don't understand. No noodle, no. noodles in the morning. 9.30. Cheryl Sandberg here isn't aware time exists before 10.30 a.m. To her generation, there's a mysterious dead zone after 4 a.m. and before they stroll into work 40 minutes late with their iced coffee. So take that into consideration for scheduling. That's very difficult for me. Fine, I'll, I'll take the call myself. Oh, thank you. Nailed it. Here's that report that you asked for. Oh. Thanks. Morgan did exactly what was asked of her, nothing more, nothing less. She expects a raise and promotion. Thanks. Junior Executive Manager of Data Consulting. Is that better than Assistant Manager of Junior Accounts? Yes. Oh my god, thank you. I'm gonna go call my parents. Now you're getting it. I need to take work off tomorrow for a mental health day. Did you know millennials can actually be exceptionally creative with reasons why they need to miss work? These eccentric excuses are normal to them, and they will be to you too. Sure, that's a normal thing. Hi, um, I know I only get 10 days paid vacation, but that wouldn't count a three-week Argentinian surf spirit quest, right? No, why would it? Oh. Ugh. Why don't you go home early today? That's it. Any questions? Why even hire millennials? Oh, right. Well, millennials comprise 19% of the workforce. If none of them worked and their parents supported them, it would cripple our economy and China would take over. So unfortunately, it's your civic duty to employ them. Trust us, we want to fire them all too, but we can't. Okay, just in fun, right? Nobody's leaving mad? Okay, good. <clears throat> so their tips for managing millennials are pretty awful. Let's not do any of those things. <clears throat> but how can we manage the millennial workforce? Since they're the biggest generation in our workforce, now and will be, what do we need to do? So we need to listen. We watched the Listen Linda video. And that's true, we have to listen to our millennials. We have to provide structure. We want goals that are clearly stated. They need to know what those goals are that they're working towards. So in, when you're defining those, what does success look like? 
millennials are ambitious and they want to know what they need to do to be possibly in a leadership role down the line. Um, and can you give them that path? If you can't give them a path, can you give them something? Is there some sort of plan? Not all companies, is there a career ladder to climb, but is there something else we can do? Millennials have the can-do attitude. They're ready to take on the world. That video said, I have to go call my parents. Okay, so that's not totally untrue. We did some research and their parents told them I can, they can do it and they think they can. So let's encourage that. Let's encourage that can-do attitude. Millennials are used to working in teams and they like to work in teams. Millennials think teams can, can um, accomplish more together. So they're not, they're not turned off by working in teams. They want to be treated as a partner. So go ahead and create those teams. They'll like that. And then challenge. Challenge is good. Boring is bad when it comes to millennials. They want work that's ever changing, ever evolving, keeping them fresh, moving the needle, doing different things. Um, technology. Again, we talked about technology, how millennials can multitask, unlike me. They can be on their phone and, and still hear what's being said. So technology is okay. They welcome change. They welcome the innovation because they've seen technology change so rapidly through their lifetime. And networking is okay. Networking, yep, it sounds scary to some of us that our millennials might want to be networking and connecting with people around the world and having their resume out there and getting phone calls. But really, this is the reality and it, it is okay. It, it kind of, it's one of those it is what it is situations and it's okay. So work-life integration. Millennials aren't into working probably the, the butt in the chair, the 60 hour work week that came from generations before. They value spending time with family, being at home, maybe, the, maybe children. They balance multiple activities because they grew up balancing multiple activities. And flexible work hours. Most millennials, and most employees for that matter, want some flexibility. So I have some pictures on the bottom here, and millennials, can you name this, um, the band that sings this song, these lyrics? Is anybody singing it in their head right now as you read through it? Yeah, me too. <coughs> anybody know the name of the band? Anybody? Hmm? Anybody? Well, if our millennials don't answer, then anybody. Millennials, do you, do you know the name? Okay. Lover boy, you're right. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Okay, we have another quick video. Hold up. Oh, shoot, why isn't it not getting me there? Technical difficulty, hang tight. There we go. So, <clears throat> this video was on my Facebook feed. These are the videos that people are watching, your employees are watching, millennials are watching. Like this or hate this, and as HR people, I know the red flags that are gonna go off in your head. We've got FLSA concerns, we've got policy concerns. Yep, we do. With this kind of video, we do. But this is the kind of stuff people are watching and expecting. Weekends can be a helpful tool in terms of work-life balance. Some people think work should be work, home should be home, never the two should meet, and if that's the way you feel, that's fine. You should not work on weekends. A lot of people realize that working a little bit on the weekends can buy you a more balanced life during the week. So for instance, if there's a certain number of hours you are aiming to work, being able to work a couple hours on Saturday morning, for instance, and then a couple hours on Sunday nights, let's say you put in five hours total during that time, well that could be an hour earlier that you could leave every day during the week. And so particularly for people who have a hard stop on their days, maybe they are picking children up at school or daycare, or they are trying to make a certain train to get home, so there's a hard stop on your day. Being able to work a little bit on weekends means that you might be able to hit that hour total that you otherwise wouldn't with those limitations on your schedule. Now I think you should be careful about it. I mean you don't want to work on weekends just to work on weekends. Um, but it could often be a good time uh, to think a little bit deeper 
about things because most people are not going to be responding to your emails instantly. They're not going to be distracting you during this time. Saturday morning might be a good time to think about those, those deeper questions, maybe crank out anything that needs to be done with a little bit more focus. Sunday evening can be a good time to think about the week ahead and strategize on how you can make the most of it. No? I think it sounds great. You think it sounds great? We've got one absolute no over here and two seats away a yes. So whether you like it or you hate it, these videos are, are on Facebook and people are watching them. It could become one of those new normals that we talked about. So how do we deal with the new workforce? It's like a wave, the new workforce, it's, it's coming and it could already be here. And so for our organizations to thrive, we need to make some changes and we need to get ready. So how are we going to deal with our new workforce? Well, we need to lead them more than manage them. Our millennials look up to managers. They look up to you. They want to learn from you. They want to receive daily feedback from you. They want to be in on the know and know what the scoop is. So plan to spend a lot of time teaching and coaching millennials. And like Stephanie said, when you made that commitment to hire them and through the recruitment process and onboarding and all of the things you do to retain them, you need to make sure that you continue to make that commitment to the millennials that you will spend time teaching and coaching them. We also talked about being an authentic leader. So don't pretend to know it all. Um, millennials want you to lead by example, walk the walk, do what you say you're going to do. And like I said, be authentic. We don't know it all. Let's not pretend that we do. Mindful leadership, that's also something that's important to millennials. They want to know that you're focused on values, conduct, and people. And they thrive on motivating others and developing others as well as themselves. So those are some ways that we can lead them more than manage them. We also need to be pretty agile. Millennials move pretty fast. They're kind of known as the impatient millennial, right? How can our organizations kind of break down some of our barriers to move a little bit faster so that millennials maybe are a little bit happier at work because we are able to make decisions faster? Inspire. Inspire your staff. Millennials want you to inspire them. They um, want your behaviors, your relationships, attitudes, values, and the environment they work, on, work in, all of those things to be inspiring. We're really developing our workforce of the future. Managers that are willing to learn demonstrate that they are also continuing to learn and grow, which millennials like to see. And they don't want to become stagnant and millennials don't want to become stagnant either. So it's important for a millennial to see that, hey, my manager's focused on learning and growing and that's important to them as well. So teach them. And when you teach them, you have to have a plan. So we want to make sure we have a plan, whatever that looks like, whatever teaching looks like in your organization. You want to have that plan. And then follow through on that plan. And if you haven't started succession planning yet, start. Because we've got baby boomers and Gen Xers with lots of information upstairs. We need to get that transferred to millennials and set them up for success. Follow, from the, follow, from, uh, follow them from the front. Be somebody that the team wants to follow uh, and the team, you want the team to succeed. You're looking out for others' success, not just your own as a leader. <clears throat> they seek <coughs> mentorship from peers and managers and we talked a lot about mentorship that our millennials want to be mentored. And they want to be coached by people that they trust. So also be transparent and have some fun. People want to enjoy their work, especially millennials. They want to enjoy their work, enjoy their workplace. They want to make friends at work. If they're not planning parties, happy hours, lunches, get togethers, things like that, that's when you need to start to worry about your millennials. So as long as they're having fun at work, you're probably going to be OK. Make sure your long-term employees make some room for millennials. Being a generation that values collaboration and being treated like partners, millennials want to be secure in knowing how the company operates, and that's where the transparency piece comes in. So make sure you're communicating to them what's going on with the organization. Millennials will be more, 
motivated by that, by that transparency. And again, make your millennials happy in a fun yet structured setting and you're building that great foundation. And what's also really kind of fun about millennials is they think of life as an adventure. So kind of approach that on how to deal with millennials with that mindset, that life is an adventure. Okay, so what about our older workers, our adult learners, which are all of us in the room? We, I, I read something the other day that said about every eight minutes for adult learners, we need to switch gears or we all start to kind of gloss over and check out a little bit. So at any point, if you guys need to stand up or move around or grab coffee or whatever, it won't offend me. You're adult learners, I get it. So our older workers kind of had that, that mindset of nose to the grindstone, work before pay, I come here to get paid every day, right? Isn't that kind of what we all heard from the older generations? It can be a culture shock for some of these older generations to work with millennials. Like, wh why do we have to have a putting green or a foosball table or Pac-Man? Why do we have to have these fun things at work? It's a little disorienting for some of our older workers. But those things are really important to Gen, Gen X and millennials. So we want to have those things in our workplace. But those kinds of things definitely can cause some stress between workers and between the generations. So how can we kind of bridge that between our longer workers, our longer term workers, and our millennials? So maybe our, our more seasoned workers can help some of our younger ones um, talking about retirement planning or mortgages, things that millennials might just be getting into where older workers have some of those experiences, those life experiences that they can share. Um, what about hobbies? Maybe a younger worker is a home brewer. Our millennials, our hipsters, you know, they, they, me too, love to go to breweries. Um, and maybe we have an older worker who is a home brewer. So maybe we can somehow make some connections like that to bridge that gap between our younger workers and our older workers. The great thing about our older workers is that they're dedicated they're punctual, they're not gonna be the one rolling in at 10.30 like in the video with her iced coffee. Um, they're honest, they're detailed, good listeners, they take pride in their work, and organized. And because they've got all of this information and all of these life experiences, these are great people to utilize as mentors. As long as they're not crusty and, and, and upset like, like Stephanie said. We don't want bad mentors. Um, older workers are more transactional. They have more transactional needs than millennials do. They really want to have control over their work. Um, developmental opportunities, they still want that, and they do want to be satisfied with pay more so than millennials. Our older workers might be caring for older parents. They might be financially supporting younger uh, financially supporting their children. They're in that sandwich of where they're, where they're caring on both sides, and that can be difficult. Studies show that our older workers are happy, but they're stressed. So knowing that as an employer, what can we do? And boomers are moving out, and Gen Xers, we're moving into that category. Older workers really want a friendly environment, a chance to use their skills, a chance to do something worthwhile, to feel respected, and again, using them as mentors. Um, older workers really do appreciate the younger generations, even if they go about doing their work differently. So with all of our workers, how are we gonna go ahead and get them all engaged? Thanks, girl. Yes, more engagement, don't let don't let your top performers get away. That's part of our focus today, obviously. Um, engagement is a huge buzzword right now because companies are losing really good people and having a hard time recruiting. Um, we talked a bit about retaining our millennials, but we have to make sure we're engaging our entire workforce. Everybody's important, um, regardless of their generation. Uh, we have to give people a reason to stay. That's first and foremost. 
Um, why do we show up every day? Why do we stay? Think about that. Um, and we, we, our competitors, again, they're spending a lot of time and money creating marketing campaigns and doing everything they can to lure your great employees away. Um, you know, the employee market, they're hard to find. When you lose people, it's going to affect your culture. Um, can you imagine, you know, you have a team of five, all five are great people, one leaves, that's going to upset people. Um, but if you have people leaving for negative reasons, they're going to talk to their friends, they're going to talk to their previous coworkers, and it, it's going to be known. There, there are no secrets anymore. I think in the past it was a little bit easier to maybe keep some of those things a little bit, a little bit hidden, a little bit in, in you know, the shadows, like we don't talk about that. Everybody talks about it now. Um, that's like the whole, in HR we used to tell people you can't talk about your salary. But we, we kind of knew better. Um, we knew it was happening. Um, if you have low engagement, you're going to have employee turnover. Um, it, there's been some studies that the average um, percentage of employees who are actually actively engaged is 30%. Which sounds, that sounds okay, until you think 70% are neutral or actively disengaged. Which means 70% of your employees if they saw an ad for a better job or had a recruiter contact them, they might be right. They might be out the door. They're ready to go. All right. Employee engagement is a heightened emotional and intellectual connection that an employee has for a job, the organization, manager, or coworkers. Ideally, you'd like two or three of these, but if you can even just get one. Get them to connect to something, it'll be helpful. Um, and again, turnover costs organizations 25 to 30% of the annual salary for the person who leaves. Um, that could end up being a lot of money. If you have three or four of those within just a month, those, that's making a big impact on your bottom line. Um, again, affecting culture, bottom line. Um, and companies with low levels of employee engagement uh, have a 33% decrease in operating income, which again, we're looking straight at the bottom line. A this, is, this is why we always, um, when talking to HR people, a this is why HR matters. This is where you can show that it's impacting your bottom line. Um, find a formula and come up with those figures because you really can show, you know, if we put more money into the employees in making them happy and creating this atmosphere, it's gonna be a bonus for everybody. Literally and figuratively. All right. So creating the culture. <laughs> if you do the right things, your employees will be engaged, and you'll have a great culture. Easy, right? Ah, uh, not so easy. The bottom line, do the right thing by focusing on your people. Um, those right things are trust, respect, and knowledge. Focus on your people, be present, be considerate. And remember that your engaged employees drive your culture. They're the ones that are going to sing your praises the loudest. But if you don't do something that they're expecting, or if you defy those expectations, they'll probably be the loudest to call you out on it. So have honest conversations about that. Uh, and when people feel good about you and your organization, they want to be there. They want to be there. They want to tell their friends about it. They want to tell everybody about this cool place that they work. And that only benefits your organization. So what is an employer who offers a work culture and workplace environment that attracts and retains superior employees? Employer of choice. All right, so. Kind of all generations, again, want similar things. It's not just about millennials. It's not just about boomers. We have to respect each one. Um, but they all want an enjoyable job, a purpose, the reason they get up every day, the reason they, they make that long commute sometimes in horrible snowstorms. Um, you know, you want to you make sure you're, you're providing purpose for those people, giving them good pay, good benefits, um, a perspective on what's important to you, the organization, Make sure that fits in with their world. Um, respect, stability, validation. And I think 
kind of the biggest one for me here is that appreciation. Um, a lot of people, and we've been saying this for years, a lot of people get that annual performance review and it's here's everything you failed at this year. Oh, well, here's one thing, maybe you did okay. That's not gonna be, that's not gonna work anymore. Um, people wanna be appreciated, they want to know that they're making a difference and that when they go to work, other people are saying, I'm glad you're here, um, thanks for the great job. That's, that's more and more important as we go along. All right, Jen's gonna talk a little bit about some new workforce regulations because we can't be HR without adding that. Yep. So we just thought we'd throw in a couple of things just for our HR people in the room. Um, things that are coming up and then just some tips for 2017 just to get you going there. So FLSA, is everybody ready? Kinda? Yeah? Okay, so you went through the duties test, make sure your jobs are um, meeting the, the numbers. Um, also with that, December 1st, if you guys didn't already look ahead, it's a Thursday. To switch a payroll process during the middle of the week would be kind of a pain, I would assume. So maybe look at if you haven't already by starting that on that Monday, which is Thursday, or I'm sorry, Monday, November 28th. So just think about that. Um, also with the FLSA changes, take a look at your handbook, your job descriptions, you might have some policies like meals and breaks, um, travel that will be impacted because of these changes. Federal contractor paid sick leave. Um, there's a bunch of information out on the DOL website, but basically they're saying on January 1st, if you do business with the government from a federal contract standpoint, you're gonna be paying some sick time out to employees. And then our other HR to-dos, there's so many. Um, it's hard to say what's gonna happen in the new year. I won't speculate at this point, um, but I would make sure your I-9s are in compliance, as always, not just because of the new year and new things happening um, in Washington. Um, handbook, always a good idea to take a look through your handbook at least once a year. And then job descriptions with those FLSA changes make sure that the status of exempt or non-exempt is accurate on those. And um, I think that's all I have for recommendations as far as HR to-dos go. Okay, I'm gonna turn it back over to Stephanie to wrap this up. Ooh. All right. Let's see. So a large part of what we've talked today is kind of the the old way of thinking versus the new way of thinking. Um, we've, we've kind of been in this new way of thinking for a while though, but some of us maybe didn't realize it or we were just kind of going along for the ride. It, the impact is getting a little bit bigger. Um, the old way of thinking is that employees are our biggest risk. Most of us know that now that yes, there's some risk involved with employment, but the employees are also our biggest asset. They're the ones who are, who are selling our products. They're the ones who are creating our plans. They're the ones that are making everything happen. And it's important to remember that. Um, the old way of thinking was top-down communication. Now pretty much everybody wants open communication. Um, you know, we, we used to talk a lot about chain of command. Um, and that was, that was thrown out kind of constantly. And now people are more like, well, I want to talk to whoever this pertains to or whoever I feel comfortable with or whoever I think has the answer. Uh, skill over behavior has become behavior over skill. So it's kind of the adage of we can, we can train a really passionate, great person to do this job, but we can't take somebody who has these skills and give them the passion that we need them to have for the organization. So that's a little bit different. Um, rigid working schedules versus flexible, um, being at your desk versus being mobile. Um, if any of you have taken your laptop to Caribou or Starbucks recently, uh, there's a lot more people there just kind of hanging out for long periods of time. That did not used to be the case. It used to be you had to be at work, otherwise you weren't working and somebody was tracking it. You never know who, but somebody is and you're probably gonna hear about it. A lot of that has gone away. Um, old way is work for the weekend. The new way is do what you love. 
Um, obviously, most of us are still going to be happy about the weekend, but if you're dreading Monday or if you're dreading Wednesday for that matter, Thursday, Friday, um, take a look at, at maybe trying to, to do something that you love or getting into an organization that supports that. The old way was corporate jargon. Um, we now have genuine honesty. That, that's a tough task, a really tough task. Um, fear of failure. We now know people want to fail fast and fail often because without failure you don't learn anything and it means you haven't tried. So if you have those people that are always kind of sitting back, they're never putting themselves out there, they're never trying anything new because they're scared to fail, that's sort of turning around. So encourage them to try and make that effort. Um, finally, the old way of thinking was to enrich shareholders. Now we're looking at enriching lives. All right. So for our future, for leaders to be effective, they're going to have to be adaptable, inclusive, and they'll have to deal with all four generations. So we can go on and on about millennials and how they're not as bad as we thought. Turns out everything's going to be fine. Lots of baby boomers are retiring. We're a little frightened about that. But we're still going to have four generations in the workplace. So you have to be mindful, be agile, again, uh, move fast when you can, inspire employees and try to always set them up for success. Um, so again, listen. And this listen will kind of comes back in everything that we do because you know um, those employers that, you know, people keep taking surveys every year and employees say the same thing every time and nothing changes. Well, they're not being heard. The organization isn't really listening to what they're saying. Finally, create that level of trust. Um, tell your employees what you're going to do, what your mission, vision, and values are, and live them. Really make sure you're doing what you've said you would. Um, teach. Um, show them the plans. Show them the plans for the future, where you're going. Uh, make sure to communicate. Um, communicate all those plans, what's happening. If something needs to change, let them know before they've finished a project, things like that. Um, feedback and be very honest about the feedback. Uh, encourage collaboration. If you have everyone sitting at their desk and it's really, really quiet, go check on them. <laughs> we don't want it to be really, really quiet. That means no one's collaborating. No one, no one is putting kind of that passion into their work that we want to see. And a family. Let's be a family at work. One of the, one of the big things is do people say we or they when talking about their workplace? Um, listen for that because the people that say we, they're currently invested in what you're doing and what you believe in. If they're saying they, it's time to think about what you can do to reel that relationship back in. And finally, don't assume. Treat people as individuals. Um, we've, we've, don't lump them into a generation. We've learned that from the millennials. Um, we've learned that we lumped everybody into kind of this little box where they were supposed to stay. And most of them don't like it. I'm pretty sure Molly doesn't like when we, we talk about the slacker millennial or when she comes in most days with her iced coffee <laughs> because that's true. But she comes in earlier than 10, so we're good. All right. Effectively lead your workforce. These are some takeaways that we found useful that I've used in the past that I thought would be good for today. Um, Schedule time each week to recognize your employees. This doesn't just mean a one-on-one. -on -one. It means literally if, if you have you know, four or five employees in a cube, take some time to walk up and just recognize them being there, what they've done for the week. Again, make sure some, everyone's comfortable with, with kind of uh, saying those things out loud. Some people prefer that in private. Um, discuss career development with all your employees. If if they can't express where they want to go, um, they'll take whatever comes along. And you don't want that to happen. You want them to have a clear goal uh, and a look at their future. And ask each employee what excites them about their job. You can actually create more excitement if you know what that is. Um, that should always be a survey question. It shouldn't be, how your, how's your manager doing? Do you like your coworkers? No. What excites you about this job? 
what can we add? What can we do to add to that excitement? Ask what parts of their jobs are disengaging. It's kind of, that's sort of a performance review on the company, right? Like asking employees, what do you not like about this place? Most often they will tell you. Um, some people won't, but the ones who will will give you very good information that you can use. Um, ask employees about their passions and hobbies. Um, get to know them as people. Isn't that what we all really want? Is to know our coworkers, our boss, anyone reporting to us. We want to know who they are as people. Um, most people, when you first meet them at work, don't say, yeah, so where did you go to college? Nope. They ask about your family. They ask about maybe where you were before, kind of what your path is. They ask you personal questions. And I, I think most people, when they're giving answers to those personal questions, it's much easier to talk about your kids. I mean, I put in examples of my four-year-old because she's everything to me. If I could bring her every day, I would, but we would get nothing done, and I would expect my millennial to babysit. That would not be good. <laughs> Um, but it would, be, it would be great. So I talk about her a lot because it's meaningful to me. Find out what's meaningful to everyone that reports to you. All right, and find ways to insert more fun. Um, our happy video is, is kind of one of our fun things. It's, it says a lot about kind of who we are as a group, um, that we keep choosing that. Uh, I don't know if we're just sort of delayed in our, in our pop culture or if it really is that cool. But whatever it is that makes your workplace fun, do that. All right, so who doesn't want a fantastic, engaged workforce? Anybody? All right, All right. well, we'll stick around up here if anybody has questions they want to ask one-on-one. -on -one. Um, Toby, anything in closing? We're good on credits? There's a lot of there's a lot of oatmeal left. <laughs> Grab some for the road. Thank you so much, you guys, for coming today. And like I said, we'll hang out up here if you have questions uh, for one-on-one. -on -one.